One of the most distinctive features of one of the most distinctive buildings here in Chicago is the external diagonal structural bracing of the Hancock Tower. The building was designed through a close collaboration of architect Bruce Graham with the engineer Fazlur Rahman Khan, who both worked at the firm SOM in 1969. Khan became famous for his tube design strategies for skyscrapers, deployed here at the Hancock and also in examples like the Sears Tower. To consider the tower like a tube means to push important structural elements out to the exterior of the building. This frees up the interior to be unencumbered by so many structural interruptions. It also stiffens the building as a result of the structure being pushed away from the center of the mass. And it also means that the structure of the building is expressed out on the exterior to become an important aspect of the way that the building looks. Today, condo units in the Hancock that have cross bracing that slices through the space, they actually sell for a premium. And even though they have an obstructed view, they do contain a tiny little piece of the iconic structure. And people who appreciate the architecture of the building also like having its uniqueness as part of their own space. But people haven't always been so appreciative of the aesthetic produced by structural expression in high-rise buildings. It's been a long road to get here, which takes us all the way back to the engineering triumphs of the 19th century France before we can come back here to Chicago. In 1875, the Royal Portuguese Railroad Company was building a railroad to connect Lisbon to Porto. But the steep river gorge of the Douro River remained an uncrossable obstacle in the way of its completion. It presented a 20 meter or 66 foot deep drop and a 160 meter or 520 foot long span. This was greater than any arch span built at the time. The railroad company decided to hold a competition for ideas on how to tackle this unprecedented feat. And the winner was a 43-year-old structural engineer named Gustav Eiffel, who proposed five iron pillars that promised to be both stronger and cheaper than any of the other entries. This was partly due to its use of prefabricated iron members that would be engineered and produced off-site, only to be erected on-site with rivets. This also meant that the bridge could be built with no intermediate scaffolding, saving time and money. All these engineering feats meant that the railroad could connect new parts of the country with fast and efficient transportation, linking it with the labor and goods made possible through the Industrial Revolution. The railway was the most dynamic industry in the 19th century, and its expansion called for ever-increasing scales of structures. A popular engraving shows the Garabit Viaduct, a similar design to the one in Porto, stacked on top of the Notre Dame Cathedral underneath the bridge's central arch. This helped illustrate the immensity of the construction and the idea that the industry was rapidly surpassing all other historical constructions that were made of stone. Engineers that were working on structures like these at the time, like Gustav Eiffel, but also people like Thomas Telford in Scotland, or Emily Warren Roebling in New York, they all believed that their work had beauty and that they were obligated to think aesthetically. They often used the word architectural for their structure to mean visual or aesthetic. Many of them resorted to at least some decoration to appease the architectural fashions of their day. The Eiffel Tower, for instance, originally just called the 300 meter tower, which was initially meant as a temporary structure as part of the 1889 Exposition Universale, it was panned by many to be just a mere machine, not an object of aesthetic beauty. Some examples of the insults hurled at the building were this truly tragic street lamp, this mast of iron gymnasium apparatus incomplete, confused, and deformed, this giant ungainly skeleton upon a base that looks built to carry a colossal monument of Cyclops, but which just peters out into a ridiculously thin shape like a factory chimney. This is despite the fact that an architect was part of the design team. Stefan Silvestre contributed to the design and was responsible for the decorative arches at the base, a glass pavilion to the first level, and the cupola at the top. And he also chose the color of the tower. But admittedly, these are just like icing on a cake sprinkled with accoutrements rather than any real integration of architecture and engineering. Interestingly, Gustav Eiffel also contributed to the engineering of the Statue of Liberty, which brings us back here to the United States. Eiffel's structural system consisted of a massive central iron pylon secured by a large masonry base. 
The copper sheets were simply hung from the internal skeleton. And curiously, the internal structure of the Statue of Liberty looks a lot like the pylon from the bridge that we talked about before. But all this structural engineering is covered up by the copper skin of the statue. The skin is treated separately from the structure inside, and each have their own purpose. And this is how at the same time and here in Chicago, buildings were considered. At the same time, it was just after the Chicago fire and we were rebuilding the city in its wake. Building back taller was made possible by bringing in metal frames to help structure the building. This was complemented with other inventions like the elevator and pressurized plumbing. But all of these were internal to the building. And part of what the Chicago School of Architecture was working on was what the skin or the outside of the building was doing as a result of all this new stuff happening on the inside. You see, the metal frame structure means that the outside of the building, it only attaches to the frame. It regulates view and weather, but it doesn't figure into the structural support of the building. Freed from its load-bearing responsibility, the facade became a blank canvas to reconsider purely architecturally. Early examples of tall buildings made like this, such as the Auditorium Building by Louis Sullivan, they have stone facades. They are heavy with large stones at the bottom and smaller ones at the top, because they are literally stacked on top of one another. One consequence of this are small windows, because large openings are difficult to make out of stone. The facade is treated separately from the floors and the structure inside, doing different work and only holding itself up. As the Chicago School evolves, the facades become lighter and able to accommodate larger window openings. Later examples, like the Carson Peary Scott building, they have terracotta facades, a type of fired clay tile which is much lighter and thinner than stone. Windows, which are important for the display of goods in the department store below, and just for getting light into the floors above, they can be much larger, almost spanning completely between the structural elements. Of course, all of this is made possible by the steel structure inside. And we've gone from a completely stone exterior to a lighter one that stretches tightly across the gridded structure. This all happened within the span of just a few years, but many still think that the structure of these kinds of commercial buildings aren't really architecture, they're just machines for commerce. Even in the 1960s, people like the theorist Colin Rowe, he wrote an essay titled Chicago Frame, where he talked about the difference between how gridded structures were treated in Europe versus the way that they were treated here in the United States. In Europe, he argued, they were imbued with ideology and meaning. The frame was a system which determines the proportions, organization, and spaces, like the vaulting bay of a Gothic cathedral, where all parts are subordinate to the gridded system. But here in Chicago, however, the grid was just considered to be just part of an expedient structural solution and commercial pressures. It's not really the domain of architecture, just engineering and finance. These buildings, for instance, don't result in a fusion of space and structure. Rather, the structure provides a neutral field that can be expanded at will and floors stacked on themselves indefinitely. Then an arbitrary facade, the only real domain of the architect in this case, is placed just to cap it all off. Structure and space are separate, therefore the structure isn't really architectural. Like the Statue of Liberty, there is this predetermined beautiful skin, a volume of space, and a structure that operates to solve the problem of holding everything up. And of course, today we have buildings that extend this line of thinking even further. Glass curtain wall skyscrapers, they seem like a natural endpoint for this line of thinking, where the facade is as light as can be, made fully of glass, with a structural grid inside to do all the job of holding everything up. 333 West Wacker is a good example of this, though it's cut in the shape of a curve along the Chicago River. But the Hancock represents another tact, where the work of the structural engineer is more fully displayed by bringing the structure to the skin. And the engineering and the architecture, they work together equally in the building's composition of space and exterior expression. This line of thinking might have branched off as a lineage from the Chicago school within the Inland Steel Building from the 1950s. It was the first Chicago high-rise built after the Great Depression, and was also designed by the firm SOM, the ones that designed the Hancock Tower. This building pushes all the structure, and even the elevators and plumbing, outside the main spaces of the building that occur along Dearborn Avenue. The building, which was commissioned by a steel company, it proudly displays the material and gridded configuration on its outside. 
Structure and space are one and the same, entwined in a sympathetic relationship. New challenges emerge as buildings get taller than 60 stories. At around that height, resisting side-to-side -side forces, called lateral loads, become more of a determining structural factor than just gravity. Gravity is easy at this size, but wind is hard. So the simple gridded structure no longer works in this case. Working with graduate students at IIT, Khan tested designs that included the iconic 45-degree angled cross bracing pushed out to the exterior. This forms a trust tube, able to resist those wind loads that are trying to push the building over. And the final solution, which represents a deep collaboration between the architect and the engineer, shows how the building works on the exterior of the building. While we appreciate this solution today, it too suffered criticism that sounded a lot like the initial reactions to the Eiffel Tower. One critic called it an ugly steel-braced colossus. Others thought that the dark, modernist tower was an eyesore, and that it didn't really fit into the context of the surrounding cityscape. You might have noticed the uncanny resemblance of the building to the pylon from Gustav Eiffel's bridge design, or even that pylon in the structure of the Statue of Liberty. While this is probably a pretty standard solution based on the way that forces travel up and through a tower, I do think that the expression of this baseline condition, it serves as a starting point for other more specific solutions where the architecture and the structure deviate from this ideal. More recently, towers like OMA's CCTV in Shanghai, it wears its structural calculations as a badge on its exterior. The unique shape of the cantilever loop undergoes tremendous, complex, and enormous loads. Rather than finding some regular pattern and imposing it with on the skin, the structural engineering firm Arup developed a more responsive approach, adding reinforcements as necessary to efficiently support the unique geometries and the forces. Or finally, we have towers like Riser Umamoto's O14, where the structure is a shell that is even offset from the rest of the building. The shell is made of concrete, and all the floors attach it for support. Here, the ornament and the expression of the architecture is the structure. The structure is also not concentrated in steel, slender members. That process of construction is additive, where you bring separate members together and you attach them on site. But instead, O14 is the outer shell is fluid, and openings are subtractions from the larger envelope. And this creates a dynamic viewing experience, and you are able to look out of multiple openings at once. But more importantly, the structuring materials and the elements, they're fully architecturalized, spatialized, and on full display. What are some of your favorite structural tower solutions? Let's discuss them down in the comment section below. And also please consider giving the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. You might also enjoy some of these other videos which come out every week on Thursdays. See you over there.